The final case on the docket for Wednesday, December 15th, 2021, is appeal number 121888, Dale M. L. Denny v. Joe Norwood, Labette County. Briefs both sides. Your Honor, that concludes the docket for the week of December 13th. Thank you, Mr. Gaiman. Council, if you would please approach the lectern and enter your appearances one at a time and then return to council table. Your Honors, may it please the court. Lucas Nodon appearing on behalf of appellant Dale Denny, present and ready for argument. Good morning. Uh, I'm Fred Phelps, Jr., and I'm here on behalf of the respondent, Joe Norwood, former secretary. Mr. Nodine, you may begin your argument. Thank you. I'd request to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Again, may it please the court, Lucas Note on behalf of petitioner Dale Denny. As a brief factual statement, we're here on a summary dismissal of KSA 601501 petition. The petitioner is an inmate in the Kansas Department of Corrections. He's classified by the Kansas Department of Corrections as managed as a sex offender due to a statutory determination with special visitation. That's according to a KDOC program classification review dated June 11, 2011. When the petitioner followed formal procedures to inquire as to the statute used for his classification as a sex offender, the unit team, a Kansas Department of Corrections official, told him, and I quote, offender registration requirements KSA-22-4901. ORA defines a sex offender in relevant part to include any person who on or after April 14, 1994, is convicted of a sexually violent crime. The petitioner's conviction predates April 14, 1994. Not only was this the response from his unit team, but it also appears in his program classification review. I quote, managed as a sex offender due to statutory determination. Further, appearing on the KDOC's sex offender information display stating the letter S, determined by statute, parentheses, type of crime. The district court granted summary dismissal, finding there is no actual difference in the management of a prisoner as a sex offender if done pursuant to a finding under CORA or under the IMPP. First point that I would like to discuss is the management under CORA. The petition alleges that the but, petition... Me, can I... Could, yeah, yes. No, no I, I, I just start with what's the distinction between being managed as a sex offender under CORA or under the IMPP in terms of how, the, <clears throat> how your client is treated or at what... It, it, terms of what, what he's experiencing in, in, in the facility. Is there any distinction? Within the facility, I don't believe that there's a huge distinction. There's a policy that deals with it. Um, outside the facility, yes, but within the facility, I don't believe that there's going to be a huge distinction. The problem it, I will get to as we go okay, through. Okay, I, I, I wanted to understand this. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's the exact question I had, is that at the end of the day, is there only, uh, is there any difference between the the hook that gets you into that classification? I, I believe the the difference is going to be through notice, uh, not necessarily in the management, but in the IMPP. It states it's upon admission, the offender will be given a notice, written notice that says you're going to be managed this way, and then there's going to be certain parts of the IMPP that say these are the differences in how your management is going to be. Specifically, restrictions on visitation, restrictions on personal possessions, additional procedures for housing and employment programs, mandatory screening for counseling treatment, specialized release planning, and post-release supervision procedures. Now, but is, is, so there's, is there a difference between the conditions that you just articulated if he's 
uh, managed as a sex offender under CORA or under the IMPP, or are they the same? Those as, far as, as far as I'm aware, they would be the same. And, and there hasn't been any violation um, that the defendant or the petitioner has been charged with as a result of not having that notice uh, of the policy? If I understand your question correctly, has he been given a, a disciplinary report for any violation? Not that I'm aware of. Um, the, the issue that I would like to come back to, I may be addressing that as well, is that same notice that we just talked about. The IMPP states that upon admission, they must be given notice. Well, in this case, the petitioners never received any notice. The petitioner, his convictions come, they predate the CORA law. So he never had that notice. Now, the, the IMPP also allows for a due process hearing if management is going to be based on a charge alone. Okay, well, that's not exactly what we're dealing with here, but it goes back to the due process elements that, that we're hammering on in this case, is how did the petitioner in this case know that he was going to be managed this way? Well, it, to be very frank with you, it's whenever he sent the request into his unit team and said, what am I, why am I being managed this way? That shows that he doesn't know why he was being managed this way. It wasn't until he pushed the issue that it became an issue, that he even realized it. That's the whole point of the notice argument that we're making here is he didn't know. Without notice, how can he contest any possible injustice in his classification or in his management? Well, isn't yes. the, wouldn't the state be bound by their claim now that he's managed under the IMPP? And doesn't that then solve the notice problem and grant your client all of the remedies that he would have under the same IMPP? In the, um, the state's computer system, in the paperwork uh, that was turned over throughout this case, it showed what I uh, stated in the factual statements that those entries are what remain in there. So one thing that we're asking is the entries to be corrected, but... What entries? Are, I'm sorry. Yeah, Help absolutely. Me. The... In his program, his KDOC program classification, it stated managed as a sex offender due to the statutory determination with special visitation. There was... And you're saying that that's not permissible under the IMPP? No, because he can't be managed under a statutory determination. He predated CORA. Like his unit team stated, um, bear with me one moment, like his unit team stated, um, <clears throat> offender, his unit, in the response, offender registration requirements, KSA 224901, that's what that entry in the KDOC computer system means. That is not his situation. Uh, imagine, if you will, the fact that if, if and when he would ever parole out, the treatment that he would receive would be under CORA. They would follow the CORA guidelines because that's what the program classifications state. You know what I don't understand is, and it, maybe I'm not as familiar with the law as you are, but uh, CORA doesn't seem to apply to anybody in prison anyway. It's registration guidelines or not guidelines, it's registration rules that apply once you're out. So you can never be managed as a sex offender under CORA while you're in prison, right? I would agree that CORA doesn't apply while in prison. Um, and I, I think perhaps that goes along with what I was just stating is if and when he would ever have the ability to parole out, he would then be managed as CORA because that's what's in the computer. Well, isn't that speculative? I mean, he's not out. So that's not what's before us. It seems like the real issue before us is what you said earlier. Look, I have to go to these treatment meetings, and I have restrictions on visitors and what I can receive in the mail. You know, why is that happening? They came back and said Cora, which to me clearly was a mistake. You know, and and you know, and then you come back and say, hey, my due process rights have been violated because I never got notice. But as Justice Stiegel just said, now you have notice. So why, why doesn't he have everything 
that he's asking for at this point because literally you can't be managed under Cora in a prison. Because, in my opinion, since he didn't have notice, he, he cannot know the restrictions that were in place on him up until, well, apparently now. But what's the remedy that you're asking for then? To return it to the district court for evidentiary hearing. On what issue? To determine if there's one, if to one, determine what he's being managed under, to two, determine if, um, I guess, if, if the management falls under this IMPP, if he received adequate notice for the IMPP, if the IMPP is retroactive to him. But that's, you know, but where, where was he harmed in not knowing? I mean, he never received any kind of discipline. You know, I, I get what you're saying, that he should have, you know, your argument is he should have received notice. You're being managed under IMPP, and here's the reason why, and, you know, here are your restrictions. But then he didn't understand it, but, you know, and they gave him the wrong answer. But now it seems like the uh, prison has said, okay, you're right, you are being managed under IMPP. And so now you have notice, and what, I mean, we can't go, I don't understand what you want for that period of time where there was a mistake. What harm did happen during that time? I believe <clears throat> so I, I believe the harm would come in the entry in the computer system. And perhaps I'm, I'm not conveying my, my point appropriately there. Um, Are you saying there's stigma attached to it? Or I, I mean, I don't understand the difference between the stigma as being, you know. And that was an issue that, that was in our brief. It, it wasn't one that I had. Well, who knew that he, you know, I mean. It wasn't public information, right? Well, if he's going, I, I believe that the classes that he would have to take as being managed that way would allow others to know that he was participating. Oh, that's under IMPP. There are no classes for CORA because you've just agreed that CORA doesn't apply in a prison context. Correct. I'm just, I'm confused. Okay. As, as to the, the harm or the remedy I, yeah, I, I guess I just don't understand what you're looking for. You want to remand for, you know, a, a factual determination that he wasn't managed under CORA, he was actually managed under the IMPP, that was a mistake, but then he was on notice later that he was IMPP. So then what remedy would you be asking for once the district court made those factual findings? I'm with you. I, I believe if there was a remand back to the district court, the district court would then be able to look at the IMPP and see the words in it that we spoke about earlier that says, upon admission, the offender will be given notice. That can't happen with the petitioner. He was admitted prior to IMPP, prior to CORA, or excuse me, prior to this. Are you saying that nobody, nobody that was admitted, because CORA is, you know, as you know, we've held, uh, Cora is retroactive, somebody that committed a crime in 1972. It doesn't matter that Cora wasn't, you know, in place. They still have to register, right? Yes. So <laughs> retroactive. And so are you saying that as far as IMPP goes, that because he was in prison before that IMPP was drafted, that he can never be managed under the IMPP sex offender program? The IMPP... It it would be our belief and our position that that is not going to be retroactive to him because it says upon admission. Okay, so is that your real issue here, and has that been briefed? No, our issue is the, the notice issue because he was never given the, the written notice to say. Would you agree he now has notice? Or are you saying yeah. that the notice had to be given when he was admitted, but since the IMPP wasn't in effect then, I, then everybody that was admitted... Uh, into prison before the IMPP was in effect, basically saying the IMPP is not retroactive. I believe that the case would give him actual notice because obviously we're here. So uh, I, I take your point there. Um, however, at some point he must, I've, I've noticed my time has elapsed, may I continue? Thank you. 
um, I, at some point he would have had to receive a notice so that then he could say, okay, this is not right for whatever reason, and perhaps file a habeas corpus action on that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for taking so much of your time. No, that's absolutely fine. Any other questions? A quick follow-up. Can you articulate, as we stand, as we're here today, what are the current unconstitutional conditions of your client's confinement? That he's being managed under the IPP because of a CORA classification in the computer system. I, I have a question. Counsel, your client has been convicted of a sex crime, correct? Yes. And um, is it is part of the problem that he is considered a sex offender because he's committed a sex crime and only because he's committed a sex crime? I don't believe that there's been any due process hearing or anything like that inside of the prison system uh, to consider that if, if that's what you're asking. Um, so you're saying he can't be referred to as a sex offender because he was convicted before CORA? Under CORA, yes. The definition of CORA includes the 1994 date when his predated that. But CORA doesn't have the corner on the market in calling someone a sex offender, does it? I believe the IMPP uh, also defines what is a sex, def sex offender as well. So no, I, I would agree with your point that CORA is not the only place for a sex offender definition. And there's, you didn't controvert that under the IMPP definition that his prior convictions would bring him within that policy. Within the IMPP or within CORA? Within the IMPP. Within the IMPP, I believe it, it, defi it uses the word sex crime as well in there. Um, under the definition of sex offender, correct. Um, as far as as far as that definition, I, I believe it would still fall under there. But the contention is that there's there's been no notice, so he had no opportunity to ask for review of that. And that's not a point that's I don't believe that points before this court at this time. Thank you. Morning again. Um, as I said earlier, I'm Fred Phelps Jr. and I'm representing Joe Norwood, who was the Secretary of Corrections under a portion of uh, Governor Brownback's administration and all of Governor Collier's administration. Governor Kelly did not retain him. And incidentally, the Court of Appeals opinion refers to Mr. Norwood as a warden, uh, which obviously is a mistake, so I'll just let you know that for your future writings. Now, um, we, we, what we have here, obviously, is a petition for review to review the June 19th, 2020 opinion of the Court of Appeals, and, and that's what that's what I have focused on. And uh, we might be two ships passing in the night here. Uh, I looked at that opinion, and of course, we agree with the result happy with the result of both that opinion and the district court. But we really had to try to divine what the court was interested in in, in granting this review. And while I'm certainly uh, happy to take questions on some of the matters that were just discussed, what struck me as something that the court might want to take a look at for future purposes and to help district courts and so on is that portion of the Court of Appeals decision that starts at page four, uh, having to do with the relationship between motions to dismiss and motions for summary judgment. And the Court of Appeals painstakingly navigated, uh, could be hazardous waters, in 
getting to the result they got to. What they basically said was the attachments to the answer that we filed were part of the pleading and therefore were not outside uh, material information that had to be dealt with under 6256 summary judgment. Counsel, I, I think you are touching on an issue that I had a question about. Um, when I look at the statutory scheme under 1501, it has its own procedures. Right. Um, and it's got a, a process for how you evaluate summary dismissal. Right. Um, and, and if you move beyond that, so an evidentiary hearing. Why, why do this, these other civil rules even apply? Rule 252 or 212. And in fact, they don't seem to mesh together very well at all. Uh, Mr. Justice Wall, you and I are on the same wavelength. And let me make a few comments and hope that I don't uh, snatch defeat from the jaws of victory in doing so. Habeas cases, and I quote, are not subject to ordinary rules of civil procedure. Said, and that you can find that language in Banks versus Simmons at 265, Kansas 341 to 349. B A N K E S versus Simmons, 265, Kansas 341 at 349. And in reliance on that bedrock principle, the Court of Appeals in uh, White versus Shipman at 54, Canap second 84, ruled that as a general rule, or ordinarily rules of discovery do not apply to habeas cases. If they did, we would be in trouble. Now, what I have said here and written is that 60.1501 and following is a self-contained, freestanding, and unique process that features two basic tracks, pre-writ and post writ. Everything that Justice Wall just said, I, I agree with, except to say that if we're on the second track, that is post writ, it's not necessary, it's not required that there be an evidentiary hearing. It just says summary proceedings. The court should deal with it summarily. It doesn't disallow an evidentiary hearing, but it doesn't require it. Now, under, the, under those statutes, and of course here we're dealing with a post-writ case, second track, under those proceedings, both pre-writ and post-writ, the rules speak of the, to the matter being dissolved. Not dismissed, but dissolved. That's a term you will never find in a civil procedure rule. The answer under 60.1504 is expedited, different from uh, what you will find uh, in the comparable civil procedure statute at 6208, the answer is verified. And the, and the statute specifically says the contents of the answer are to be taken as true unless they are disproved, which is the exact opposite. If you look at the petition for review, there are many references to the fact that the petition should have been taken as true on its face. That's the 6212B6 standard. That does not apply to a habeas petition. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Once the answer is filed, which was done in this case, and had attachments, it had the IMPP attached, it had uh, the Casper page attached, and it had the data sheet attached on, on Mr. Denny, all of that is to be taken as true when the court summarily addresses the petition. It's a summary proceeding, and there's a special clause in 6015.05a that applies to inmates in the custody of the Secretary of Corrections, and it says the motion and the files are records when they conclusively show that the inmate is entitled to no relief, the writ shall be dissolved. So we're talking about a summary. I wrote some parallel or comparable brisk quick, get to the heart of the matter kind of a proceeding. It's not a civil case. It's not a case that's going to go on month after month after year after year with various proceedings. I think if the district judge here did anything that was erroneous, the district judge was far too lenient 
In this case, we, we are now four and a half years since the petition was filed. The case material takes up two expansion files. There have been three lawyers, plus Mr. Denny was allowed to act in a pro se fashion. There have been two hearings at the district court level. There's been the Court of Appeals consideration. This is not what the statutes envision when they say it's a summary proceeding. So, so, so that's how, my spiel. You, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Phelps, but was it just simply a mistake to refer to his classification as a sex offender under CORA? Uh, and how did that, how, how did that happen? Well, yes, Your Honor. Uh, and, 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 and so what happens when there's that mistake? Doesn't Mr. Denny have a right to proceed in the fashion that he did? Well, I, he certainly had the right to file a Back petition. up here. How, how did that CORA thing even happen? How did that happen? Uh, judge, we have 3,500 employees. This was far, five or six years ago. Not everybody that works for us is intimately familiar, I'm sure, with the law. Uh, I don't even know if that person that wrote that knew what that person was saying. The bottom line is, uh, Mr. Denny is and has been, he's been convicted of three serious sex crimes under the INPP, that's the definition of a sex offender, and he obviously now knows and has known for a good long while that he's being managed under the INPP. Uh, the district judge, I don't know if I could say it any better, uh, in the, uh, at the end of the June 28, 19 hearing, on the motion to reconsider said, obviously Mr. Denny knows that he's managed under INPP 11115A. <clears throat> now, it's been brought up in court numerous times. That's why you're being managed as a sex offender, he said to Mr. Denny, because you have sex convictions. You know that. You're not entitled to a due process hearing under the INPP. So he has notice. And of course, the court's very much aware of the general rule that prisons need to be given considerable latitude in the way they manage uh, their inmates. And, and, and we have, last I checked, about one out of every four inmates in Kansas, or one out of every five anyway, is a sex offender. And we spend a great deal of time and staff dealing millions of dollars a year providing treatment and things of that nature. So uh, I don't, he knows what's happening. He's known it for a long time, and it will continue to happen. We have that responsibility to the public, I believe, as a department, uh, to provide that service. What about the, the argument that I heard opposing counsel make that the way that the entry has been made within the Department of Corrections, that it's <coughs> his classification is being tied to CORA, whether obviously there's a legal problem with that, but just the fact that that entry exists is going to prejudice him at some point down the road uh, before the parole board. What, can you, what's your response to the, that argument in terms of a possible injury? The only time that I'm, that I'm aware of in the case law that a sex offender can claim any type of prejudice or stigma, or whatever you want to call it, is if they are classified as a sex offender and on the basis that they have been charged with a sex crime but not convicted. We don't have that here. Our policy specifically says, if you're going to be classified as a sex offender for that reason, we will give you a due process hearing. We have a very elaborate procedure to do that. Other than that, there's no legal basis. The, remember, a policy does not create a constitutional right. The failure to comply with a procedure does not create a constitutional violation. And in fact, if you look at the last, and the IMPP is in the record, by the way, it's attached to the department's answer. If you look at the last page of the text of the policy, it specifically says there's nothing in here that creates a constitutional right or amends or modifies existing law as it relates to constitutional protection. That entry that your opposing counsel referred to about um, under uh, sex offender under statute just refers back to the nature of the conviction, not to CORA? I think, uh, uh, Madam Chief Justice, and again, uh, I don't know precisely 
but I think that was a reference to Cora. Uh, it certainly could be construed as a reference to a violation of a criminal sex statute. In any event, that's history. We're here now. We've been here now for a long time, and Mr. Denny is managed as a sex offender under the policy and will continue to be so managed. But I understood your opposing counsel to say that's still what is showing up on the computer record. That has not been corrected? Uh, I don't believe there's any evidence of that one way or the other that I've seen in the record. Well, does that mean, then, that there does need to be an evidentiary hearing to get that cleared up? And, or does he have a right to have that clarified? Uh, he, he does not. That's what I was attempting to say just then in response to Justice Wall. There's no constitutional right uh, to any type of notice. Really, the, the only time it even, the reason it comes into play is because the policy says we'll give them notice. But again, it's not about, if we, if we fail to follow our procedure, and that certainly happens, we have nine or 10,000 offenders and 3,500 staff members, there are going to be boo-boos. Uh, but that does not create a constitutional, a constitutional right, uh, is the bottom line to that. And uh, so that's what I would say on that. Is there any difference of which you're aware uh, as to how Mr. Denny would be managed if it's under Cora or if it's simply because of his criminal conviction? Uh, no, ma'am. Um, we, we would not. The, the actions or the, the procedures and practices that we take as it relates to visitation, as it relates to treatment and so on, would not change. It, we, we are not in any way suggesting we're managing under Cora. That's a totally different statutory scheme, and uh, I hope that helped. But I, I would like to say, if I could, I'm, I'm almost out of town, but time, out of town. I talked about this other issue because, uh, and I would appreciate it if the court would take a look at that, because there have been two or three opinions of the Court of Appeals where they have gone down the road of requiring compliance with Rule 141 under KSA 6256 on these habeas cases, and uh, they're turning them into more than they should be under the statutory procedure. So I would ask that maybe we can claw back some of that and um, get it back to where the district courts and the Court of Appeals is following 60-1501 and, and at SEEK as it relates. You know, you can go through there, and I've done that, and I won't, I won't bother you terribly with it, but uh, the petition is totally different than what's under uh, the civil procedure. There's the writ. There's no writ listed under 6207 as a pleading. Uh, the service is unique. The statute, statute of limitations is unique. Uh, it, it's a totally different, and well, as I said, and all due modesty, I'll just repeat it and then I'll shut up. And that is 6501 at SEEK is a self-contained, freestanding, and unique process, completely outside the scope of the rules of civil procedure and involves two basic tracks. It's been a, a pleasure. I appreciate this opportunity and I congratulate the court on getting back to oral arguments. Uh, it's been very, a very smooth process. Thank you. Three minutes. <clears throat> Just a few brief points, then I'll conclude as well. <clears throat> as Mr. Phelps stated, um, it would probably be good to have some clarity on the court on what can and cannot uh, come in on the initial phase. Um, that I think would be beneficial to everybody involved. Um, as to that matter, though, um, in order for the district court to determine there was no difference between the IMPP's management and management under CORA, the district court had to take evidence that was not present in those pleadings. Let me ask there, you a question yes. about that. I, I actually did go back and look at the record, and, you know, uh, first, he, he had his 
uh, classification review, and that's where we have that language that says managed as a sex offender due to statutory determination. And then a few days after that, um, he asks his CCI, what Kansas statute does the KDOC use to manage a person as a sex offender? That's on 3-7. And then um, on 3-9, two days later, he says, as per my yearly review coming up in July and our conversation yesterday, which would have been in between the two, um, about the sexual offender override under IMPP 11-115, uh, please put into action my request for the override. So it seems like, you know, it was all kind of cleared up there on March 9th where he understands he's being managed under IMPP and he's requesting an override. I, I agree. I remember what you're talking about. He, he did make the request to be uh, for the oversight correction. Um, no, an override. Override, right. Yeah. The override through, uh, I believe it's a committee that they right. have. Right. Um, and I believe, um, I believe he was even granted some difference. Through right. that so process. when the district court is ruling, you know, on deciding whether to summarily dismiss um, a 1507, they take into account the whole record, right? When the whole record shows that, and so isn't he basically saying, admitting right here he knows I'm being managed as uh, under IMPP 11-115, and I'm asking for an override. So this is his due process. He followed, I, I understand what you're saying, thank you. Um, he followed the process for it, but would the, the better approach for him been to have not followed the policy at that point? I mean, I, his, his contention is, I can't be, I can't be labeled as Cora here. And they're, they're saying, here's this policy, you can request this, but the only way that he can request the override is to follow the policy. He, he didn't have another option. So Right, because CORA doesn't apply. I, I agree CORA <laughs> doesn't apply. That's why we're asking for the, the status to be removed. Um, and it also, it doesn't say CORA, does it? it? Oh, I guess it does when he responds. In the unit team's response, it does. In the unit team's response. Uh, I believe the KDS... 2249 or and I believe the KDOC record just says statutory, though. I don't believe right. the KDOC. Right, you're, you're correct. So, um, the, I believe it was um, the attorney for, for the other side, Ms. Cole, I believe at the time, that stated it at the district court level. And I'm going to use her exact words from the transcript. I mean, it could have been a simple error. I can't explain why it says that particular statute. But what we have is a legal issue and a factual issue. If we want to turn this into a factual issue, then we need to have a hearing where I would bring in a classification person to explain the criteria upon which he is managed as an incarcerated individual as a sex offender. And that's the point that I'm, I'm making now, um, which was in our brief, but the district court had to make factual determinations based outside the record. That's our position. Any other questions? Thank you. Counsel. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel for your arguments in this matter. We will take this appeal under advisement.